Hi everybody, welcome back. This is Earth and Space Science 102. I'm Stephanie Welch and today we are going to start to move away from weather and into climate. Um, and specifically we're going to be addressing man-made climate change, but I'm going to also start with natural climate change. So we're going to look at the natural range of variability and the kind of cycles that that operates on, and then I'm going to move into what happens as a result of man-made processes in the next lecture. So these two lectures, lecture seven and eight, are really sort of parts one and two of the same story. In this first lecture, we're going to start with addressing the difference between weather and climate. Um, then we're going to look into how we understand uh, climate variability and prehistorical reckoning. Um, so in the, in the distant past, how we determine what the climate was like at that time. And then we'll look at um, somewhat of the, the total range of variability and the mechanisms that drive that variability. Then in the next one, in uh, lecture eight, I'm going to go into man-made climate change. You know, so then we'll be talking about the release of CO2 into the atmosphere, its work as a greenhouse gas, and how that is the primary controller of, of climate worldwide. Okay, so to get us started today, first thing I want to address, most important thing to address in defining the difference between these two lectures and everything that we've talked about in the class so far, is the difference between your day-to-day -day weather patterns and climate. Now, specifically here in Louisiana and really almost anywhere else in the world, you can have an incredible range of temperatures, even from one day to the next, or if you pick a day, one year, let's say December 1st of 2015 versus December 1st of 2016, you can have wildly different temperatures. But those temperatures are only going to be variable in a certain range because of what's going on with the climate in some particular region. So weather is the conditions that are going on in the atmosphere in a short period of time. So that could be hours to days to even potentially weeks. And that's going to be mainly controlled by what's going on with air pressure. So it's basically everything that we've talked about in the class so far over the first, primarily the first five lectures. Climate is very different in that it's how the atmosphere is going to behave, how it's going to work over a certain region of the Earth's surface over a long period of time. So in terms of a long period of time, we're not even talking about a year. Typically we're talking about decades or even longer periods of time. Now, not only does weather change from day to day for purely natural reasons, but climate also does the same thing over really long periods of time. The trick, though, is that most of the things that are going to control climate are going to be really long-acting. These are things that are going to take hundreds of thousands to potentially millions of years to accrue any sort of big change in climate. There's only really one thing that naturally or artificially changes the climate over a short period of time. That's going to be any changes in the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. So to kind of put a cap on this difference between weather and climate, I wanted to show you, I wanted to start us off today with a very short clip from um, the Cosmos TV show, the new version in 2014, hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, he addresses the difference between weather and climate in uh, the 11th video in that series. So uh, we'll, we'll cut to that now so you get uh, another way of looking at the difference between weather and climate. Okay, so if we scientists are so good at making these dire long-term predictions about the climate, how come we're so lousy about predicting the weather? Besides, this year, we had a colder winter in my town. For all the scientists know, we could be in for global cooling. Here's the difference between weather and climate. Weather is what the atmosphere does in the short term, hour to hour, day to day. Weather is chaotic which means that even a microscopic disturbance can lead to large-scale changes. That's why those 10-day weather forecasts are useless. A butterfly flaps its wings in Bali, and six weeks later, your outdoor wedding in Maine is ruined. Climate is the long-term average of the weather over a number of years. It's shaped by global forces that alter the energy balance in the atmosphere, such as changes in the sun, tilt of the Earth's axis, the amount of sunlight the Earth reflects back to space, and 
the concentration of greenhouse gases in the air. A change in any of them affects the climate in ways that are broadly predictable. My friend's meandering represents the short-term fluctuations. That's weather. It's almost impossible to predict what will attract his interest next. But not hard to know what the range of his meandering will be, because I'm holding him on a leash. We can't observe climate directly. All we see is the weather. The average weather over the course of years reveals a pattern. I represent that long-term trend, which is climate. Keep your eye on the man, not the dog. Weather is hard to predict, like my friend here, but climate is predictable. Climate has changed many times in the long history of the Earth, but always in response to a global force. The strongest force driving climate change right now is the increasing CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels, which is trapping more heat from the sun. All that additional energy has to go somewhere. Some of it warms the air. Most of it ends up in the oceans. All over the world, the oceans are getting warmer. All right, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of a taste of the difference between weather and climate. And what we're going to be talking about through the rest of the lecture today and the rest of the next lecture is going to be climate and not weather. So just because it might have snowed in a place like Louisiana where it doesn't typically snow, or just because it's a cooler than average winter in some particular location, it doesn't really have an overall um, uh, uh, factor in terms of climate unless that pattern carries out for a number of years, for at least a decade or even longer. So most of the world's focus right now is on um, man-made climate change, and we will definitely address that. But I wanted to separate out first uh, man-made climate change or anthropogenic climate change versus not man-made climate change, the natural range of variability and the things that are going to drive that variability. Now, in order to understand that, we need some way of understanding what the climate was like in the Earth's past, both in terms of historical reckoning and even before that. So as it turns out, we can look at climate from not just 100 years ago, but from 1,000 years ago or 10,000 or 100,000 years ago. We can even go millions of years into the past and get a reasonable understanding of what the climate was like in different locations of the world. And particularly when you go back across very long periods of time, you can tell that there has been an extraordinary range of variability, but usually as a response to very, very slow mechanisms and slow drivers. First thing I wanted to do, though, is, is to give you a little taste of how we derive this information, how we understand uh, climate in the Earth's past. One of our most important sources of information are isotopes of certain elements that are going to become enriched due to variations in temperature. And therefore, those isotopes become a proxy for temperature. They, they give us an understanding, or at least an estimate, of what temperatures were like in the past. So one of the most important and the, one of the ones that are the, is the easiest to understand is the relationship between heavy and light oxygen and hydrogen in water. So when you have a range in temperature, that means you're also going to have a range in processes that are dependent on temperature, like evaporation. Evaporation is highly dependent on temperature. You have much greater evaporation rates when temperatures are high, much lower evaporation rates when temperatures are low. Some processes, like evaporation and certain life processes, are going to take a preferential form of an element, and that form we call an isotope. It's basically just a heavier or lighter form of that particular element. So there are two relatively common isotopes of oxygen. Uh, one is sort of the normal oxygen, and that's oxygen with a mass of 16. There's also oxygen with a mass of 18 that's substantially more rare. We can look at the ratio between these two types of oxygen and get an idea of evaporation rates in the past. And because evaporation rates are dependent on temperature, we can use that as a proxy for temperature. And we can do the same thing with hydrogen, heavy and light forms of hydrogen, hydrogen with a mass of one and hydrogen with a mass of two. It's all going to be tied back to temperature. 
So evaporation preferentially takes the lighter isotopes of a particular element, leaving behind and enriching the seawater with the heavier version. That becomes embedded in ice, that com becomes embedded in certain minerals that are precipitated out of seawater, and then those minerals and those other specimens like ice, and even maybe the seawater itself becomes a record of temperature for the distant past, taking us well beyond um, human accountability and human reckoning. So that's probably our most important proxy for temperature, but there are others as well. You might have heard of the use of tree rings in determining how severe a, a winter was um, or a, a, how severe seasonality was in a particular year. The thickness of the tree rings is an indicator of how cold that particular winter was. You can even use rock types, um, rocks sedimentary rocks specifically that were deposited on the surface of the earth in the earth's past as a record for temperature and other uh, aspects of climate. So in this picture in particular that I have up for these, um, these uh, uh, rock types and how you use rock types as a proxy for temperature and for climate, you, we have these sandstones that are cross-bedded. So they're found out in the, in the West today in places like Arizona, and the way that they're laid down, the way that they're deposited in these cross-bedded units so that they're sort of angled is an indication of the environment of deposition of these um, uh, pieces of sand originally. So in the very, very distant past, hundreds of millions of years ago, this entire environment used to be a very, very arid desert with sand dunes. When those sand dunes were eventually buried and lithified, they carried with them the way that they were deposited on the surface of the earth to begin with. And therefore, we can use them as a record of climate, both in terms of the idea that the environment was fairly dry um, and in terms of temperature, that you had temperatures that were pretty high. So it was a hot, arid environment. And that record is there from the rocks that were deposited on the earth's surface at that time. So you have to take all of these pieces of the puzzle, all of these proxies for temperature and other aspects of climate like um, precipitation, and put them all together to get a complete record of the, um, of the climate in a particular area. And using all of this, we can determine that there has been a huge range in variability in climate near its past. Sometimes that variability drives these big events like mass extinctions because you have climate changing fast enough so that life can't keep up with those changes. So throughout the entire Phanerozoic eon, and that's a big word that's left over from geology in, in the 101 class, um, basically it just means the last 540 million years. In that time, in the last 540 million years, temperatures on the surface of the Earth have actually been far, far warmer than today. And those temperatures have allowed for certain types of marine organisms to prosper and even um, dinosaurs to be very, very prosperous on the surface of the Earth. So Earth on average across the entire Phanerozoic has been 8 to 15 degrees Celsius warmer than today. So that's a total range of around 15 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, warmer than today, so substantially, substantially warmer than today. And to see that total variability, I give you uh, this chart here that has the entire range in temperature across the Phanerozoic, so the last 542 specifically um, million years of climate change. Now, this record has been smoothed out, so a lot of the really sort of small ranges in variability, the effects of um, ice ages, for instance, across the last two and a half million years, are sort of smoothed out on this graph, and you don't see those, not in terms of looking at the entire Phanerozoic. But in a minute, we'll zoom in on just the last two and a half million years, so you, you can see that there's variability in, an even, in a smaller scale than what we're seeing here. First, I wanted to start out with the entire Phanerozoic, the last 540 million years of Earth history, or essentially the entire time where large organisms have been around on the surface of the Earth, animals, plants, fungus, and so on. 
So you can see that there's been a huge range in variability and we get this data primarily from the oxygen isotopes. So a, a number called the DELO18 for, um, uh, for oxygen as a proxy for temperature. It just basically means the ratio between heavy and light forms of oxygen as a record for temperature. So we get this entire range of variability, and you can see how there have been some points in the Earth's past where temperatures are cooler than today, but primarily temperatures have been warmer than today. Now that doesn't mean that what we've experienced over the last hundred years and what we're going to continue to experience in the future isn't a problem. It just is, is something you have to sort of balance against the idea that climate on average has been warmer and that is not necessarily a bad thing. It's mainly a bad thing for us thriving in the kind of range of temperatures that we have on the surface of the earth at this time. I wanted to point out two particular points on this graph, um, two periods in the Phanerozoic where we had mass extinctions. So one is at the end of the Permian, a time period marked by the P at the top and bottom of the graph. The very end of the Permian, we see this very, very, very steep warming trend brought about by the release of carbon dioxide from a massive amount of volcanoes that were all getting set off essentially as Pangaea was starting to break apart. So this was all happening about 250 million years ago and the release of CO2 in the atmosphere as a result in this case from volcanic activity set off the biggest mass extinction in our planet's entire history. 95% of marine species went extinct. 70% of terrestrial species went extinct as a result of this event. So the big takeaway message is when climate changes f too fast for life to evolve to keep up with the change, the result is the massive eradication of species on Earth. A very similar thing happened, but with a different kind of change in temperature at the end of a time period called the Cretaceous. So this was at the end of the Cretaceous 65 million years ago. A meteorite impact possibly coupled with volcanic eruptions that sent a lot of ash into the atmosphere and the meteorite sending a lot of debris into the atmosphere, reflected temperatures and led to a cooling of temperatures on Earth so much so and so fast that dinosaurs and a lot of the species that thrived in a really warm world at the end of the Cretaceous went extinct as a result. So whether it's warming or cooling, really fast climate change is never a really good thing for life on Earth. So the other thing that I kind of wanted to emphasize was that it's all about what time scales you're looking on uh, to, to see what's going on with climate in the past. I wanted to start off big. I wanted to start off with the entire last 540 million years of Earth history so that you could see some of those really, really big events and that you could see that on average temperatures were warmer than today. If you focus in on a little bit more of a narrow slice of Earth history, just the last two and a half million years, and that's even still, two and a half million years is long before human civilizations began. In the last two and a half million years, we've also had a range in variability in temperatures. We've been plunged in and out of these ice ages that primarily affect North America and Europe. So these ice ages began two and a half million years ago with the formation of the land bridge that connects North and South America and its effect on ocean circulation. And this has allowed for these very small changes in Earth's position in space and our orbit around the sun to allow for those changes to affect climate. So the Milankovitch cycles that we've talked about already in Lecture 6 and we'll continue to talk about later on today, those have been a huge uh, player in our um, natural variation in climate over the last two and a half million years. So we've waned and waxed in and out of these ice ages. And even though we're at this point today in a colder period compared to the entire Phanerozoic, we are also considered to be in a warm period between ice ages. So again, it's all about how you look at it.
So to see this total range and variability, I have this uh, record of CO2 concentrations and how those CO2 concentrations drive changes in temperature, um, both in terms of positive and negative away from today's temperature. So the zero line on this graph on the far right side, that zero line is today's sort of um, temperatures. You have temperatures that go four to eight degrees lower than that as a result of the natural variation due to getting in and out of these ice ages, and even slightly warmer than that. So what you can see is that we have this very, very routine dip in and out of both smaller ice ages and large ice ages. We have these big ice ages that occur roughly every 100,000 years, and smaller ones that occur roughly every 10 to 15,000 years. So our planet, based mainly on the Milankovitch cycles, has a way of getting in and out of these ice ages, just as things like plate tectonics and volcanic activity have caused us to have this um, bigger range in temperatures over longer period of time, longer periods of time. So I wanted to just give you a picture of North America and give you an idea of what just four degrees uh, lower overall range in temperatures in terms of degrees Celsius can really do to our conditions across North America. This first picture that I'm showing you is one of a series of, of um, paleogeographic maps that Ron Blakey put together at Northern Arizona University. And this first one gives you an idea of what the conditions were like on Earth around 120,000 years ago. So this is long before human civilizations began, almost 12 times longer um, ago than civ human civilizations began in the most dramatic of the recent ice ages, in the worst of the recent ice ages. So you have a total range in, in temperature between this picture and the next picture I'm going to show you of around 4 to 5 degrees Celsius. So if you drop temperatures by around 4 degrees Celsius, this is what North America looks like. The thickness of the Laurentide ice sheet, the thickness of all of the white on this picture, is around two to three times the height of the Empire State Building today. The rest of North America is dramatically changed by this range in temperature. The western part of North America becomes uh, much more rainy. You have huge freshwater lakes that develop, and sea level is substantially lower at this point than it is in, it going to be in the future when you're between ice ages. So go from this picture, where we see conditions in the Quaternary in the most uh, dramatic of the recent ice ages. And as we go up to present, you can see sea level increase. You can see all that ice go away. And all of that ice has to go somewhere. A thickness of two to three times the Empire State Building of continental ice sheets, when they melt, that increases the amount of water in the oceans. And because you have this range of temperature that you're affecting the oceans with, whenever you increase temperatures on Earth, the water in the oceans actually takes up more space. It expands when it warms. So both of these things coupled together means a rise in sea level. Okay, so we have, we went from conditions in the past to conditions at present. And the last picture I want to show you is a possible picture of the Earth's future, given completely unchecked, human-influenced global warming. So this is not a picture of what your total range in temperatures really should look like as we vary between one ice age and the next. But maybe five, six hundred years in the future, this last picture could actually be a reality. National Geographic did a special on what would happen to sea level if all the ice melted. If you took all of the ice that is currently on the continents and the Greenland ice sheet uh, in, on um, the continent of Antarctica, and if you took all of that ice and melted it, if you had a total range of temperatures that allowed for all that ice to melt, you'd basically end up with conditions that are very similar to the conditions we had back in the Cretaceous when the dinosaurs were roaming the Earth. You would have sea level that was 212 feet higher than we have today. Now, 
when you look at the effect of that across the entirety of North America, it's a really, really substantial effect. But when you look at it across what would happen to Louisiana, most of Louisiana, even northern Louisiana, is simply just gone as a result of this. Particularly in Louisiana and other places along the Gulf Coast, we are incredibly vulnerable to any kind of change in sea level. So in addition to showing you this picture, I'm going to show you some pictures at the end of the next lecture, lecture um, eight, that are going to focus in specifically on Louisiana and show you not just what the possibility in five or six hundred years would be, but what the possibility even by the beginning of the next century would be in terms of what our coastline would look like with a smaller amount of sea level rise. Now, the direction that I want to go with the rest of this lecture today is trying to kind of move back and focus in on natural variations in climate so that we can separate what controls climate naturally and what controls climate artificially, how we are influencing climate. That's what we're going to address in the next lecture. So the natural causes of climate change can basically all be summed up as anything that's going to, in a very, very long-term sense, affect the climate of even the, uh, either the entire planet or a specific region. So specifically, or, or you know, or maybe not specifically, more generally, um, you could sum it up as anything that reshapes the Earth's surface. So anything that reshapes where the continents are and where the oceans are and how the oceans circulate, that's going to affect climate. Forces that change the amount of solar input from the sun, and that could be any changes in the sun itself, which are very negligible and happen over very small time scales, or any changes in Earth's position in space or the shape of our orbit, that's going to potentially affect climate. Those are the Milankovitch cycles. And finally, any changes in the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. That is probably the fastest driver of climate change and the one that is going to uh, most dramatically affect species on Earth, such as ourselves. Okay, so the first one that I wanted to address, anything that reshapes the surface of the Earth. That's basically just another way of saying plate tectonics. And I spent the, you know, a huge chunk of the 101 class discussing the whole subject of plate tectonics. So if you didn't take 101, if you didn't uh, go through it with me, I'm going to just kind of briefly sum it up here. Plate tectonics is this set of processes on Earth that changes the shape of the Earth and the position of the continents and creates things like mountains and earthquakes, ocean basins. These are all going to be the result of the plate tectonic cycle. Because the interior of the earth is hot, it creates uh, this effect of forcing apart plates on the surface of the earth. And when you force apart those plates, you create colliding plates elsewhere. And the shifting around of these plates creates all of the effects of plate tectonics, continental drift, uh, mountains forming, earthquakes, uh, repositioning of the oceans, and so on. Now, the trick with plate tectonics is that it takes an incredible amount of time to accrue any kind of realistic big changes, especially those that could actually affect climate. If you're talking about the climate of a particular region being influenced by plate tectonics, you need a substantial amount of movement of a particular continent to accumulate any kind of real change. Take, for instance, us in Louisiana. Ultimately, around 200 million years from now, North and South America will collide. You will have an uplift of the entirety of South Louisiana, and we'll be standing on essentially mountains here. Maybe not us personally. In 200 million years, we're going to be gone. But maybe some future generation of humans, if we survive on the planet that long, will be on mountains in South Louisiana. Now, it's going to take 200 million years for this to occur, 200 million years for some kind of real big substantial effect on climate to actually affect us here. And so that's one of the big takeaway messages from plate tectonics. Everything concerning the repositioning of the continents, the effect on volcanic activity because of the plate tectonic cycle, these in terms of the plate tectonic cycle are going to take a really, really long time to add up to any kind of substantial change. It takes... Um, it takes plates on Earth about the same time that it takes your fingernails to grow. 
to move on Earth. So to move miles, it takes thousands of years. To take a continent and move it to the other side of the globe takes hundreds of millions of years. The entire time lapse in this picture where you go from almost a supercontinent configuration on the left hand side, almost a Pangaea configuration, to the modern day positioning of the continents has taken 250 million years to happen. So therefore, we can say that the effect of plate tectonics on the climate cycle is extremely slow. And we certainly can't blame what's happened over the last hundred years on the plate tectonic cycle. Now, a whole lot of people, when trying to deny climate change exists, man-made climate change exists, like to pull out the fact that Earth wobbles in space and that the positioning of Earth changes over time and that that affects climate. We've already addressed that as a long-term Earth motion, but I'm going to talk about it again very briefly today in terms of these things called Milankovitch cycles. So Milankovitch cycles do actually affect our climate. And over the last two and a half million years, they've dipped us in and out of ice ages. So it's sort of a combination of the plate tectonic cycle and the Milankovitch cycles that have allowed us to get into this ice age cyclicity that we're in today. Two and a half million years, North and South America became connected and that redistributed ocean, oceanic circulation. And then that caused the Milankovitch cycles to play a bigger role in our climate. So these Milankovitch cycles are 10 to 100,000 year cycles that do affect climate, but they don't operate on really short timescales that can actually affect climate on Earth in 100 years or 50 years. These take at least thousands, if not tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years to accrue any kind of re realistic change. Now, to briefly sort of remind you of these, these three processes that are all part of the Milankovitch cycles, the most short term of these cycles is something called the precession of the Earth. It's basically the wobble of Earth when you're thinking about Earth as being positioned sort of around its rotationary axis. So not only does Earth spin, it spins around on a little bit of an incline, and that incline changes over time and wobbles around in space. That's a 24 to 26,000 year cycle. But the seasons become flipped as a result of that cycle. The obliquity of the Earth changes from 22 to 24 and a half degrees, and the amount of axial tilt that we have on Earth influences climate. Essentially, the more tilt, the greater range of variability you can have across a wider swath of the Earth's surface. Finally, the eccentricity cycle is probably the biggest driver of climate of any of these components of the Milankovitch cycle. The eccentricity cycle is going to change the shape of our orbit from something that's closer to a circle to closer to an ellipse and then back again. It takes 100,000 years for that entire cycle to occur, but over that cycle, we can actually have our distance away from the sun play a bigger role in climate than it does today at a point where we have a more circular orbit. Our orbit will never be perfectly circular, but it's closer to a circle at different points during the eccentricity cycle. So to get us in and out of those big ice ages that we've experienced over the last two and a half million years, one roughly every hundred thousand years, it takes a big change in the eccentricity cycle. So the difference between like, let's say that Laurentide ice sheet picture that I showed you of 120,000 years ago to conditions we have today, that's mainly as a result of the eccentricity cycle coupled with combining with these other two components of the Milankovitch processes. So Milankovitch was correct in terms of these processes controlling climate. And now that we're today with today's technology able to look back into the past and understand the total range in climatic variability, he was proven to be correct. So all you have to do is to look at the um, total range in temperatures that we've experienced in just the last 400,000 years to really get a good idea of how these Milankovitch cycles work and on what kind of time scale they work.
The big key takeaway is that they are on an incredibly long time scale. Not as long as the plate tectonic cycle, but certainly much, much longer than the kind of climatic variability that we've experienced over the last hundred years. They certainly cannot be blamed or pointed to as a mechanism for the kind of climate change that we've experienced since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Now finally, the last thing that affects climate on Earth naturally, and as we're going to find out in the next lecture, unnaturally, anthropogenically, is anything that changes the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, our atmosphere is composed mainly of nitrogen and oxygen. And these two molecules, nitrogen pairs in the atmosphere and oxygen pairs in the atmosphere, are non-greenhouse gases. Meaning that as sunlight comes in through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets absorbed by the surface, and infrared heat is radiated away from the planet's surface, they don't stop the heat from leaving our atmosphere. They allow the heat to just go back out into space. There's a very, very small percentage of the Earth's atmosphere that is composed of greenhouse gases. These are more complex molecules, things that are typically composed of maybe more than one element in, in a lot of cases, things like water vapor and carbon dioxide and methane. All of these are composed of more than one element. So when that heat is radiated away from the surface of the planet, it becomes entrapped in these particular molecules. Now, some natural processes on Earth will release some of these molecules. Volcanic eruptions, for one, release CO2 into the atmosphere and sulfuric acid and a little bit of hydrochloric acid into the atmosphere. And as gases, these do the work of retaining temperatures and they can actually affect climate. Now, what we're doing today, of course, is releasing CO2 by an entirely different mechanism, by the burning of fossil fuels like coal and natural gas and oil. By doing that, we do the same thing that these volcanic eruptions do, just on potentially a much larger scale. Now, the volcanic eruptions that have occurred in the Earth's past, some of them have been incredibly substantial and far, far larger, many, many orders of magnitude larger than anything that we've seen on Earth in the last 500 to 1,000 years. Anything and really any sort of human reckoning pales in comparison to even like, let's say, the Siberian trap eruptions of 250 million years ago. So really substantial volcanic eruptions can release enough CO2 into the atmosphere all at once to extraordinarily affect climate and to affect it very, very fast. And those fast changes in climate are essentially impossible for life to keep up with. Life cannot evolve fast enough to come up to be able to compete with those changes in climate and organisms and entire species die as a result. Now, volcanic eruptions and things like meteorite impacts can also, in some cases, have the opposite result on climate. So in terms of the release of greenhouse gases, volcanic eruptions can actually cause climate to warm because you're releasing more greenhouse gases into the environment and into the Earth's atmosphere. Volcanic eruptions can also release an incredible amount of debris into the Earth's atmosphere. Some particularly explosive volcanic eruptions, like the one pictured on the uh, slide, uh, the Mount Pinatubo eruption of 1992, released an incredible amount of ash into the atmosphere. And that ash, when it gets suspended up in the atmosphere, it actually reflects sunlight away from our planet and can cause localized cooling or even worldwide cooling for some short period of time. Meteorite impacts essentially do the same thing. A large meteorite impact, like the one that's thought to have led to the extinction of the dinosaurs, release an incredible amount of debris up into the Earth's atmosphere that stays suspended up in the atmosphere for a very long period of time, reflecting sunlight away from the planet and causing cooling. So again, this is just one of the natural mechanisms of climate change. The big ones that we talked about were the effect of plate tectonics, and plate tectonics is often going to be the slowest driver of climate change, the one that takes potentially millions of years to accrue any kind of substantial change in climate. 
And so those kind of changes in climate are slow enough so that life can evolve fast enough to keep up with those changes. The same is less true for the Milankovitch cycles, but the Milankovitch cycles only work over a certain range in variability. Um, the Milankovitch cycles often work over 10 to 100,000 year cycles. Those are everything that controls Earth's position in space. And then finally, the effect of, going back to the plate tectonic cycle, the effect of volcanic eruptions. Vol volcanism in general is controlled by the plate tectonic cycle. So for instance, when you take the continents on Earth and you arrange them all together as one big supercontinent, the effect of arranging all of those continents together is to insulate the mantle and create a lot of heat that eventually comes up to the surface in terms of massive volcanic eruptions. And those massive volcanic eruptions can often lead to mass extinctions because you're changing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere and thus affecting climate faster than life can keep up with, and species die as a result. Now, in this explanation of natural mechanisms for climate change, I didn't even address some of the even shorter term processes, like the El Nino cycle, that are sort of somewhere between weather and climate in terms of how they affect conditions on Earth. Uh, the El Nino cycle, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation, is, you could almost kind of think about it as part of the plate tectonic cycle and the effect on ocean circulation. Um, the effect on ocean circulation in the Southern Pacific creates this range in temperatures across the equatorial region that causes a range in climate worldwide, and it's on a roughly six to eight year sort of rotating cycle. So at not even going into um, even sort of shorter term processes like that, you can see that most of these natural mechanisms for climate change are fairly well understood. And if what was going on in the last hundred years since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution was in some way able to be tied back into natural variations in climate, we would absolutely know about it. But we really can't tie it back to anything but man-made processes and, and our, our man-made effect on the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. So in the next, the very, very next lecture, in Lecture 8, that's what we're going to address is man-made climate change, how we're affecting the composition of the Earth's atmosphere, and the effects of climate change going forward into the future. So until next time, keep looking up.